just being thankful for what the Lord has given us. Um, I enjoyed Pastor's prayer this morning as he talked about the sheer number of people, even in the United States, that are trying to go to church this morning and they're hungry. They didn't have any food. And they had no easy way to get to church. And then we've got our international church family, that many of them are facing untold danger just to get to a worship service and praise God. So we want to thank, think about them this morning and be thankful for that. So as we open in prayer, um, pray for those. I mean, we, let's face it, I've heard a lot of people say it, I've heard a lot of pastors say it, we have it pretty easy in the Western world when it comes to worship and being able to worship God freely. And we need to be thankful for that but also to recognize that he's probably calling us to a lot greater things than we're allowing ourselves to do. And so let's be thinking about that this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for your blessings. That your mercies are new every morning. Lord, we don't deserve it. There is nothing we can do to earn heaven. Nothing we can do to earn your grace but you give it to us for you. So Lord, we thank you this morning for the blessing of this holiday as we look forward to celebrating the birth of our Savior. So we ask you to be with us this morning, Lord, as we commune and sing praises to you and listen to your word this morning, Lord, that it gets planted in fertile soil, that our hearts are tilled and open to learning what you want us to do. So we lift all of this to you this morning, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Want to stand and join us this morning?
Southern Baptist affiliation, uh, and this is an annual offering for foreign missions. And let's, uh, we can. churches have been unable to have physical gatherings, but by God's mercy, the Church of Jesus Christ continues. The Southern Baptist Convention continues. For 175 years, we have pressed forward together through wars, disasters, plagues, economic downturns, and political upheavals. Our effort of proclaiming Christ around the world has never stopped. The doors of our International Mission Board have never closed. The good news of Jesus Christ cannot be isolated away from the world. Your support, your prayers, your gifts, all of us working together as the body of Christ have kept our missionaries on the field over the decades and keeps them there now. God is at work around the world in the most amazing ways, and he is using you, your family, and your church to help your missionaries, our missionaries, as they move forward with the gospel. The Derbyshires partner with churches in the United States to lead mobile clinics all over Thailand, using medicine as a means to share the gospel with those who have no other access. Christ is proclaimed. Disciples are made and churches are planted. In Kenya, IMB missionary Kristen Lowry believes the very best place for a child is in the family. That is why she is working alongside national Kenyan partners to rescue boys living on the streets, restore their lives, provide shelter, a trade, physical and spiritual nourishment, and reunite them with their families. The Worthy family has recognized the importance of investing in relationships and in Italian culture, which is why they have planted their lives in Italy for the past 17 years. College students have dropped the term hard places 
from their vocabulary and are responding to go anywhere in the world where people don't have access to the gospel. Tens of thousands of Venezuelan refugees are being met at the border by Colombian Christians and missionaries like Robin and Paul Tinley. The IMB is helping Venezuelan immigrants accelerate the process of moving from a stage of crisis where they don't have a roof over their head or food to eat to the beginning stages of stabilization. In the midst of crisis, Many immigrants are finding a new and firm foundation for their lives, Jesus Christ. Missionaries in London, England are reaching international students who are in this open city for two to four years before returning to their home countries, many of which are closed to the gospel. The Harrell family is taking the family approach to ministry living alongside the people of Mozambique and making sure their children are integrated in every aspect of mission work as they lead people to faith, believers are baptized, and churches are gathered. The beauty of this partnership we as Southern Baptists call the cooperative program is that we are able to do so much more together than if we were chasing this vision alone. Our partnership helped 535,325 people hear the gospel last year for the first time. We have been entrusted with the message of life in Jesus Christ, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We treasure Jesus and his gospel above all. But let us remember, we are not called to hoard the gospel, but to herald it far and wide. We are not called to stockpile the gospel, but to send it forth to those yet in darkness that they may see the light of Jesus Christ and live. All right, so that's about the Lonnie Moon offering. We have envelopes in the back, and they may or may not be in the pews. Uh, are they in the pews? No, I don't think so. They are, okay. <laughs> But for the next four weeks, there are going to be ways for you to contribute to the Lottie Moon offering, uh, which have its own special envelopes. It's a way that we give above and beyond our, our tithes and offerings to the local church. Uh, all the churches in the Southern Baptist Convention do this uh, at this time during the summer. Over the next few weeks also, we'll be showing a few more videos that highlight other foreign missionaries. And then also on December 26th and that Sunday, we'll be highlighting our very own foreign mission, missionaries in Steve and Jean Mounts who are going to be traveling to the jungles of Brazil and ministering to the indigenous people groups in the jungles of Brazil. And so we're going to be able to hear about their mission. They're going to be taken in February. Uh, and, and so we have our own missionaries from our church going off overseas uh, to spread the gospel and, and much more than that as well. And so we look forward to hearing more about that on December 26th, the day after Christmas. Uh, so please be looking forward to that. We have our very own missionaries we can be supporting. Anytime a local church has their own missionaries to support, man, that is that should be the goal of every local church, to have missionaries to send out, uh, that we're not disconnected from the missionaries that we support. Missionaries need the support of the local church because that's ultimately who gives those missionaries oversight, who vets them out, who sends them out uh, to spread the gospel is the local church that those people were discipled in, that they grew up in the word in, uh, that they are held accountable by. So every missionary uh, ideally should be held accountable to the local church that sends them out. And so we have a responsibility. If we know that we have missionaries in our midst, uh, we have a responsibility to vet them out and to support them as they go out with the gospel. Uh, so for the next few weeks, we'll uh, be expecting a few more highlights of missions videos. Uh, a couple of things we have going as well is we have our Christmas paint night. It's an awesome fellowship time uh, coming up in a couple weeks, a couple Saturdays from now on December 11th. The deadline to sign up for this is next Sunday because we have to make sure we have enough supplies for everyone. So please uh, sign up by next Sunday, December 5th. There's a physical sign-up sheet in the back on the information table. 
as well as you can sign up online uh, on our church website too. So uh, we got one week to sign up for that. Also, we have Martha's Diary. These are tickets or invitations uh, for you and to pass out to your neighbors and your friends and your co-workers to invite them to a gospel presentation uh, presented through a live performance in Martha's Diary. Uh, so this is kind of our Christmas play, our form of the Christmas play. So we have two nights where this is showing. Uh, so take these, some of these home. There's plenty of invitations on the back table. Uh, you should be praying about who God has laid on your heart to invite to this because of this video. Uh, because of the mission of the video of, of the Lottie Moon offering is to spread the gospel. And that's the purpose of Martha's Diary is to spread the gospel. We have our own mission field right here in Winthrop Harbor and the surrounding community. We are missionaries in this sense. We are sent here. God has placed you here. God has uh, ordained you to be here to not just hoard his love and grace to yourself, but to be mindful of those around you who need to hear the gospel. Uh, also, we also have these um, information cards. If you want prayer, that's what these are for. If you are interested in more information about our church or in membership, uh, that's what this is for. There's a little box you can check on there. If uh, you want to make sure we have your information so that we can include you in our communications, that's what these are for. Uh, to make sure that we can communicate with you effectively, please make sure we have your information. Uh, that's what these cards are for. You can turn these in the offering plate. At this time, uh, I'd like to ask our ushers to come forward as we pray for God's blessing of our tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Lord, as we keep our brothers and sisters around the world in mind this morning, sometimes the weather being too hot or too cold can stop Americans from worshiping this, from worshiping you, the one that they, so many people in America profess to believe in and to love and to worship. God, I pray that you free us in America of all forms of idolatry. We don't need certain conditions to be met in order to worship you. There is only one condition that needs to be met in order to worship you, that is our sin needs to be cleansed and forgiven. And that condition was met through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. He is the reason why we gather on Sundays. He is the reason why we call this the Lord's Day. God, I pray that you rid us of all forms of idolatry, that we would not be hindered in our worship towards you. When we say what we believe in and when we say what we, that we love you, may be evidenced by our zeal to worship you at all costs. And Lord, our giving, our tithes and offerings to the local church is just one of those ways of releasing our grip on those, that, on those things that could have a grip on us. We release it to be used for your services, to be used for the purpose of the, the ministry of the gospel. And our tithes and offerings is just one of those ways that we are able to worship you by acknowledging that all things belong to you and all things have been given to us to worship you and to serve you. We pray, we pray for your blessing over these tithes and offerings that they'll be used according to your purposes and your will. Thank you for providing abundantly for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Today is also the first Sunday of Advent, where we celebrate the anticipation of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For centuries, churches have celebrated this season by lighting of candles to commemorate the coming birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The first candle to be lit today is called the Prophecy Candle, which has to do with the spreading of God's Word of hope. Let's listen together from God's Word, the scripture for today, selected from Micah, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. This is the candle of hope. The prophets in Old Testament times were full of expectation that eventually the Messiah would come to bring hope to all the world. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we live in the presence of that very hope. That Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father and he intercedes for us every day and every moment. Let us not fear anything. Let us recognize that he is always there, that he never takes a break, that he never strays from us, only we stray from him. But Lord, we ask you to draw us close to you this season. Let us look forward in hope to the peace that only you can bring, 
and I surrender our hearts to you. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, worship team. We're taking a quick break from our series going through 1 Timothy. We only have a few weeks left in that series through that letter uh, from the Apostle Paul writing to his, uh, to his son in the faith, Timothy. We're going to be spending these, these next five weeks looking at the, the prophecy of the birth of Christ and the birth itself, of course, for the Christmas season. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Micah chapter 5. And I almost forgot some important announcements. Uh, I'll pull them up here. The Sheffields, Avonlea and Parker, had their baby. That's doing well. They are at home now. They're healthy. The statistics on the on the on the baby girl. Uh, her name is Jordan Marie Sheffield. Born at 7.1 pounds, 20 inches uh, long, and 2:09 p.m. on three days. I think it was Wednesday. <laughs> if I get it right, I believe it was Wednesday. Um, but that was, those are the stats of the new baby that we have to um, welcome into our into our gatherings here on Sunday. So we're looking forward to seeing them again when they're all when she's all rested up and healed up. So be praying for them and their recovery, uh, and be praising God for a healthy birth uh, of another of another human life ordained by God's sovereignty. Uh, we also, next Sunday, we have um, our final triannual business meeting. Uh, it's been communicated in several ways, online, through email, uh, letters are sent home, it's on the church sign, and, and uh, I'm telling you and reminding you again right now uh, that the business meeting is next Sunday, so please don't forget that. It will it'll be for approving and discussing uh, the budget for next year, uh, which is a big deal, so please be there for that, be a part of uh, of the congregational uh, responsibility of, of being involved in that process of the church life. Uh, so Micah, here we are in chapter, in Micah chapter 5. Move this down a little bit. In Micah, we look at some of the themes throughout this book. This prophet Micah was uh, his time of prophecy was around 750 to, to 686 BC, which makes it about 100 years before the exile and the captivity of, of Israel and Judah, but also about 700 years before the birth of Christ. And we would look at all the times in the Old Testament when there's a shadow of Christ or something that points to Christ. It's a reminder to us that the, this Bible, this book we have, is not really just one book. It's many writings written over the span of time by many different authors in many different places, and they all tell the same story in something that we call progressive revelation, meaning that things are revealed by God over time. And so for people to think that the Bible is just this book that one person wrote uh, because they felt like it, or or uh, only one person contributed it, or, or somehow this, this whole Bible was, was put together at one sitting or at the same time, that that's preposterous. Because what this is, is, uh, is a chronology of events that happen after one another, revealing God's plan over time. And, and so it, it's, it's non nonsensical to think that this book is somehow written all at the same time by one person or a few people. You know, these are many writings written by various people of various backgrounds, various languages, and yet it all reveals the same God. And so we look back to this time of Micah when he was about 100, 100 years before the, the nation of Israel and, and Judah were taken captive because of their sin. They were being punished by God. Uh, they were taken away by the Babylonians and the Syrians because of their sin. But we look at the great promises that God has for them even before they were taken away. That God reassured them that this, these things are going to happen in your future. That this punishment for your sin is going to happen. But guess what? I have an even greater plan to restore you from your sinful state. And that's the overall message of the gospel. That our sin is worse than we would think that it is. 
when we look at it in God's word, we find about we find out how bad our sin really is in the eyes of the holy God. But then there's that promise of restoration in our sinful state. And so be looking for those themes in this book of Micah. I encourage you to read through it one time, uh, just in one sitting. Read through it. Take notes on what themes stand out to you and what the promises of God are to his people in this book. In John chapter 5, verse 39, and I'm just going to remind you of uh, this bookmark here that has this QR code on here. It has all our uh, scriptures that we're going to be going through this morning in order. If you want to follow along, um, if you feel like you're not able to keep up and turn in the physical pages of the Bible, you can rely on your smartphone for that and just scan this QR code and you'll be able to click on the passages as we go along here. But John chapter 5, Jesus says, You search the scriptures, meaning everything in the Old Testament, because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they, it is they that bear witness about me. So if you look at this passage in Micah, it's just another one of those areas where the scriptures bear witness about the Savior that was yet to be born, but the promise of the Savior that was going to bring these people out of their suffering and was going to be their hope to look forward to in the midst of their suffering. A quick summary about Micah uh, is we see right away in chapter 1 of Micah, tells you when this was written, when he, got the, when, re, when he received this prophecy. It says, The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Now here's the significance about Samaria and Jerusalem. Samaria was inside the Israel's borders, the, the 11 tribes that rebelled against Judah and, and uh, uh, Rehoboam, and then uh, with Jerusalem being just south of there, was in the, within the border of Judah. And so in other words, this, this prophecy has much, uh, has, has to do with both sides, Israel and Judah. It has to do with all of God's chosen people, all 12 tribes put together. This prophecy is for them. And, and we see that in Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, if you look at Matthew chapter 1, they are in the lineage of Jesus himself. And so there's, there's uh, interesting implications there. If you just read through Matthew 1, through the genealogy of Jesus, you're going to see the names Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and so on. It goes all the way down to our Savior, Jesus. There's a promise of judgment in Micah in chapter 3. Verse 9 to 12, where God says, Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight, who built Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity, its heads give judgment for a bride, bride, its priests teach for a price, its prophets practice divination for money, yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house a wooded height. In other words, their pride led to their destruction. They, they lived in their sin in such a long period of time, where they kept thinking that because of God's chosen people, nothing bad could happen to them. And their pride got to them, thinking, well, we're God's people, therefore we can get away with anything. And it was not true. They were offering sacrifices time and time again. They meant absolutely nothing, because it wasn't coming from the heart. It, was, it wasn't coming with any real repentance. And then in chapter 4, we see this promise of restoration. Where it says, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, it shall be lifted up above the hills, and all people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples, and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall, uh, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall sit, every man, under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one 
shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For of all the peoples walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. And moving on to our passage that we're studying today is Micah chapter 5. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid up against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, and from ancient, of day, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. We take this passage from the beginning, but first let's pray for God's blessing as we study his word together. Lord, we look to you as a source of great wisdom, not from man, not from my mouth. There's no number of hours a, a human being can spend studying your word to where they can match your wisdom or match your knowledge. Your word is a living word and we rely upon it to direct us in our life, to point us to Christ, to assure us of our salvation. God, we pray for your blessing now as we read your word, we study it together, and we take to heart what you have to say to us this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. In this first verse here, it says, Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. See, just laid against us with a rod, they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. Now, what's referring to here is at that time, if you want to read the, uh, what was happening at that time, you'll go to 2 Kings chapters 15 to 18. That's when you'll read about Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah. And read about what was going on there and how evil the kings were and how evil the rulers were. And the Assyrians were coming around them and they're preparing for war. And no matter what, they, what the nation of Israel did or no matter what Judah did, no matter how hard they tried to prepare for this coming battle, they knew that they're going to lose. It was a very defeating message for them at that time, that no matter how much they mustered their troops, it was guaranteed that they're going to lose. Because of their sin, because of their pride, God is now going to bring upon them his wrath to, to uh, discipline them for his name's sake. And so if you want to read about it, it's in chapters 15 to 18. This idea about being struck on the cheek it, it may very well be pointing out in 2 Kings chapter 25 where they literally take out the eyes of Zedekiah. When, they, when Babylon comes in and, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar comes in, they take his eyes out. And, and this is something they did to many people when they took them in captivity. Not only would they blind them, but they would put hooks in their noses, link them up together. Uh, make them slaves immediately. They would put markings in their ears or ear earrings, uh, chain them together. Uh, and so striking someone in the cheeks oftentimes was it's just this idea that they're they're being defeated. They're being defeated. In 2 Kings 25, it, it goes back to this instance when, Zeb, when Nebuchadnezzar came in and said, they slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. They put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him in chains, and took him to Babylon. What this prophecy is, is doing is warning them, number one, muster your troops for the, the, the surrounding people, the enemies, what does it say here, that the siege is laid against us. If you read in, those, in, in, in that chapter, 2 Kings 25, you're, you're going to see what they did. They literally laid a siege against us. Siege, uh, they sieged their walls. They put up barricades. They climbed the walls. They laid up a siege against them. And with a rod, they struck the judge of Israel on the cheek. And they defeated him. They took him away in slavery. And as this defeat is promised, they still have something to look forward to in the, in the second verse of Micah chapter 5. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, 
whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Uh, this word ephratha literally means fruitful, or to be fruitful, or that, uh, fruitfulness. And the irony here is that Bethlehem is, is known for being this little town that really um, was similar to how Nazareth w was viewed. You know, what good could come out of Nazareth? Bethlehem was not known for being a fruitful town. It was a small little town. And that's when we get the song, Oh, Little Town of Bethlehem. And so the irony here being used of fruitful Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, who from you shall come forth from me, who is to be ruler in Israel. Now, if you read through the fulfilled prophecy when the Savior is born, uh, you might see that the gospel writers changed this a little bit. Instead of saying you are too little uh, among the, to be among the clans of Judah, they changed to say you are not too little to be among the clans of Judah. Why? Because the Savior was born in Bethlehem. And it's, this, it's this contrast now where the, where the writer is, is taking this prophecy that was in Micah chapter 5, where it says, Bethlehem, you are too small to be among the clans of Judah, but because the Savior was born in Bethlehem, it, it, he's using that same prophecy as saying, this clan of Judah in Bethlehem might be small, but it's not so small that a Savior can't be born out of it. And, and so they change the words around in that, in that fulfilled prophecy is to say Judah, Bethlehem, not too small to be among the clans of Judah. Because that's where the Savior is coming out of. <coughs> and so you see a little irony here. And from the days of old, this, this ruler of Israel is going to be coming forth from the, is from of old, from ancient days. And in this, in this passage, is not so much referring to the co-eternality of, of Christ. It's not necessarily referring to Jesus being uh, an eternal being, as we understood, as the Word was with God and became flesh. But it's referring back to the line of David, that this promise from the days of old through David, through his lineage, there is always this understanding there will be this leader that rise up in the, line, in the lineage of David. We see this in 2 Samuel chapter 7. It says, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish a throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me, your throne shall be established forever. Now very quickly, this passage looks to Christ, and some of you might be wondering about that one verse in there, when he commits iniquity, I'll discipline him with the rod of men, uh, with the fulfillment of Christ in that passage, is not so much that Christ learn to sin, or that he sinned. It's not talking about uh, this idea that somehow the Messiah sinned, but more the idea that the Messiah grew. We saw in, in, Luke, in the Gospel of Luke that the Messiah, as a young boy, as a teenager, he grew in knowledge and wisdom. He still had, somehow had things to learn uh, uh, from the Father in heaven, even though he is fully God and fully man. But he grew in wisdom and in stature. But we look to these prophecies of Christ. One of the questions that came up time and time again for me in this in the study of Micah is what are you waiting for? And what am I waiting for? What are the people of Israel and Judah waiting for? They're waiting for this ruler to be born. They spent they spent almost 70 years in captivity. And they're waiting for this time of restoration. They're waiting for this hope that was supposed to be born and that, that Savior didn't come for another 500 years. I think a valid question for maybe people to be asking today is what are you waiting for? What sufferings are you going through? What, what challenges are you going through where you find yourself waiting? You're waiting on God to do something. You're waiting for God to show up somewhere. You're waiting and the question that kept coming up in my mind in this passage is, what are we waiting for? Because these people are waiting in the midst of their suffering. They were promised this suffering because of their own sin, 
But they were also, they were also promised restoration with their holy God. And it didn't come in their timing. They were continuing to wait and wait and wait. In verse 3, it says, Therefore he shall give them up until a time when she who is in labor has given birth. The rest, then the rest of his brother shall return to the people of Israel. And Micah, uh, in this verse, verse 3, chapter 5 of Micah, Therefore he, who is it he, this ruler that's going to be born, he shall give them up, the Israelites, tribe of Judah, he's going to give them up until the time when she who is in labor is given birth. Uh, once again, the, this, uh, this could be a very easy verse to say that's talking about the Virgin Mary, but I believe it's referring to the nation of Judah itself. That from this nation of Judah will be birthed a Savior will be birthed this ruler, and then the rest of his brothers, those brothers born in the nation of Israel and in Judah, shall return to the people of Israel. When she who is in labor has given birth, the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. When this nation gives birth to this ruler, and who are the brothers? It's the rest of those who were born in the nation. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus was asked this question, or actually, he was told that his mother and his brothers were waiting outside. No one to see him. In Matthew chapter 12, it says, While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside and asking to speak to him. This is Jesus. But Jesus replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my mother and my brother, but it is my brother and sister and mother. You know, the gospel went first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Jesus pr first preached the good news to the Jews, his physical brothers and sisters in, in the nation of Israel, and then he preached to the Greeks and everyone else and the Gentiles and the tax collectors and the Romans. In Acts chapter 10, Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. This is the hope of the entire world. That whoever fears him, whoever does what is right is acceptable to him. There is hope to any person in the entire globe. It is not restricted to any people group, to the nation of Israel, to any lineage or bloodline. Galatians chapter 3 reiterates this, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God. Who are those all? He says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave or free, male or female, you are all one in Christ. So going back to Micah, where it talks about, Therefore he shall give them up until a time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. A God's chosen people uh, will come to find out through progressive revelation that God reveals things over time that it wasn't just the Jews that he was referring to. It's those who were grafted in to God's people. And God had chosen them all along before the foundations of the world. Who would be grafted in? They didn't know that at the time. But it was later revealed through uh, Peter's vision, through the Great Commission, through several forms that God revealed to them, hey, my people are more than just the Jewish people. My people are all those who place their faith in Christ. Amen. So we go to Micah chapter 5, verse 4. It goes on to say, And he, this ruler, shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, the majesty of the name of his Lord God. And shall dwell, and we, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. In John chapter ten, we, we see the image of Jesus being the good shepherd. He says plainly, "I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. For just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice." So there will be one flock, one shepherd. And Jesus is famous for using the, the, the parable of the 99 sheep and the one that was lost. Matthew chapter 18, he says, What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep 
and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. Now, it's, I think it's important to point out in the context of this parable, if you read the whole context, the 99 that never went astray were actually representative of the Pharisees at that time. That they would believe themselves to be so self-righteous that they consider themselves to be these 99 sheep that never went astray from God. But the fact that Jesus is talking about the shepherd who leads the 99 to find the one that was lost, and he rejoices over the lost one more than the 99, is because Jesus is being confronted in his ministry to the sinners. His ministry to those who were lost, that no one was going after. The ministry to the prostitutes, his ministry to the tax collectors, all those people. Jesus rejoiced much more when those people came to faith than those Pharisees who kept arguing with Jesus and kept trying to stop Jesus' ministry because what Jesus was saying was that they weren't good enough. Because that's how they tried to get into heaven, was because the Pharisees thought that they were good enough. And that was the opposite of the message of God. In Psalm 23, we see the shepherd, this famous passage, is, I've read this numerous times, countless times at memorial services. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When we look at this passage in Micah, how it ends, where in verse 4 it says, He shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, and the majesty of the name of the Lord is God, and it shall dwell secure. What does Psalm 23 end with? I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In Micah chapter 5 it goes, to, goes on to say, And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And it looks forward to this future. It looks forward to this future of this future peace that will never end. This peace and this hope, this joy that will never end. Israel's only hope from their suffering was this ruler that was going to be born at the proper time. That was their only hope in the midst of their suffering. And they continue to suffer in many ways, even in the days of Jesus walking this earth, ministering to the lost. But they were still under the Roman, the authority of the Roman government that, that, that made them pay taxes and had, had, a, had a law on top of their laws as well as long as the Jews were well behaved and they were able to practice their religion uh, however they wanted to. But if they ever went outside certain boundaries and the Roman government would come in and, and, and correct it. There is still this oppression that they were going through at the time of Christ. And Israel's only hope was this Messiah. At Easter time, we read all the passages about the triumphal entry when Jesus rode in on the donkey and he rode in, he rode in on the colt, the, the donkey that, that, that's supposed to communicate peace. If a king is riding in on a donkey, he's not coming to fight, he's coming to make peace. And then the people saw that image of him and they were greatly confused because they were hoping Jesus, if he was the Messiah, then where are his weapons? If he's going to be this ruler of Israel, how come he doesn't have weapons and a shield in his hand to fight with? And this nation of Israel that was under the impression of the Romans was confused. How will their suffering end if their ruler, their Messiah, doesn't even fight for them? Because that is what they're waiting for. They're waiting for God to come in, to send this Messiah in with weapons and with strength and power, and to, uh, to probably, they're probably envisioning another Saul, another King Saul, someone who was taller and bigger than the rest, someone who obviously could fight and could beat the Romans. Israel was waiting for God to show up in a very certain way. 
And when Messiah showed up in a different way than what they expected, they rejected him. They crucified him. And all that fulfilled the Father's plans from the very beginning is that he would be rejected by his own, only so that after the fact, people could be cut to the heart. They could be convicted afterwards. And this happened in the early church when Peter preached his first sermon. The Jews said they, they heard the message. They heard from Peter that they are the ones that put the Savior to death, who had risen again. And they pleaded with Peter, saying, what shall we do? And that's when we get that first statement from Peter saying, repent and be baptized. Even though they're the ones who are guilty of putting the Savior to death, they still had the hope of the gospel. Because it all fulfilled God's plan. God showed up in a way that they were not expecting. In a way that they were not, that they were waiting for something else to happen. But it was not what they expected. They rejected it, but then later on many Jews came to believe in it. And still many Jews reject it from even to this day. And I think a lot of times they were wondering if Jesus is the Messiah. We see examples of this in the, in the Gospels. They wondered. How come he can't bring himself down from the cross? They were mocking him, saying, if you are the Messiah, bring yourself down, free yourself. If you're the Messiah, then command angels to rescue you. If you're the Messiah, how come you can't physically overthrow the Romans? If you're the Messiah, then how come you didn't heal or raise everyone from the dead? How come Jesus only raised some, uh, is a friend from the dead? How come he only healed a lot of people, but not everybody? And people could be asking that question. If you're the Messiah, how come you didn't stop to heal everybody? And I think that's a really common question that we could be asking in our own lives. You know, they even said to Jesus in, John, in the Gospel of John, you know, if Jesus was here, then Lazarus wouldn't have died. If Jesus was the Messiah, then how come he even let his friend die that, he was crying, that they thought he was crying over when in reality he was crying because of the lack of faith that was, he was surrounded by? I think some of the questions that we could ask today is, if Jesus is the Messiah, then how come I'm still sick? If Jesus is the Messiah, then how come my loved ones are still suffering? If Jesus is the Messiah, then how come my finances are struggling? If Jesus is the Messiah, how come my relationships are broken? If Jesus is the Messiah, then how come I'm still struggling with addictions or sin issues? And these are valid questions, questions they hear all the time. People say, well, if God is so powerful, if God is so loving, then how come all these things are still happening in my life? And I venture to say, because we are, meant, we are much like the nation of Israel, where we fail to look to God's word and telling us what to expect from him. And we have our own understanding of what we should be expecting from God. When the nation of Israel was in captivity, they believed the false prophet who told them, don't worry guys, don't, no need to unpack your things. God's going to get us out of here, uh, not in 70 years, but in just a matter of months. And they believed him. Why? Because that's good news. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to get out of that situation uh, sooner than later? And the prophet Jeremiah came, came back and said, you gave him false news. You, you gave him, you gave him a, you're a false prophet. And Jeremiah gave him the real news that they're, they're to be comfortable. They're to, to, to start families, have children. Plow the land, because they're going to be there for a while. But people much rather want to believe the other guy's story. And by the way, God put, put that false prophet to death so that he wouldn't spread any more false news. But I think we often make the same mistake as what they made. We have our own understanding of what to expect from God. What, 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 our own understanding of what God is supposed to do for us. And we're not looking to his word and saying, what is it that God is truly saving us from? He's saving us from what Micah was saying that God is going to save them from. He's saving, he saved the nation of Israel from the punishment of their sin. He restored them from their sinful state. That is what God's promise is for each of us today. God restores us from our sinful state. This is the bad, this is the bad news for a lot of people because a lot of times we don't want to think of ourselves as sinful as what the Bible tells us that we are. 
We, we want God to free us from all the, the, the worldly issues that we're going on, that we're, that we're going through. Physical suffering, financial suffering, relational suffering, mental, mental issues, whatever it might be, emotional issues. But those will soon become idols in your life. If you are so used to being physically healthy, and all of a sudden that is taken away, it's easy for that physical health to be an idol in your life. You're saying, I refuse to be happy until I get this back. But something that God promised us is forgiveness of sins and restoration from our sinful state. More comfort than we could ever experience in this, this worldly life here that only lasts a few years because Jesus said someone can gain the whole world and still forfeit their soul forever. So why would we idolize all the things that just last a few years in exchange for eternity? That's when we read through scripture, what is it that God prompts to do for each and every person who places their faith in this Messiah? He promises to restore them from their sinful state so that when they go through all those other sufferings, they will have a clear mind when their finances aren't there. They'll have a clear mind of what biblical stewardship looks like. They'll have a clear mind of where everything comes from in the first place, or, or who it comes from in the first place. When we're struggling with our relationships, we're struggling with our sin issues, or, or addictions, and all those other things, we will look to ourselves first and say, what am I doing that contributes to this situation? It's not so much everyone around me, but what is a sin in me that needs to change? And that's what's going to make you more understanding of all the struggles that you're going to go through in this life. When you have loved ones who are going through sicknesses and health struggles, you're going to be able to look through those situations with a clearer lens, knowing that, you're, that the most important thing that they can have in that moment is the gospel. That they, if, if they're to be healed by God for another 30 years, but yet never hear the gospel... And that's a shame. God gives us help so that we can preach the gospel. He gives all the unbelievers help so that they can hear the gospel. As long as someone's alive, as long as the Christians are alive, we're going to be bringing the gospel. As long as there's non-Christians alive, that means they can hear and receive the gospel. And so we all go through these forms of suffering, but the good news for us is our hope is here today. We're not waiting anymore, right? The, the Savior is born, he lived, he died, he rose again, and our hope is here right now. We don't have to wait like the people of Israel did. There is another waiting period that we are in currently right now, and the scripture calls it perseverance. It, call, it calls it perseverance. And when we place our faith in Christ, God enables us to persevere to the end. Because there's this greater waiting period that we look forward to on that day, that great day when everyone is brought together. The day that the nation of Israel always looked forward to, this day of the Lord, when everybody who belongs to God, they will all be brought together for eternity. Yeah. And so in some sense, we're still waiting for that day, but we don't have to wait for salvation itself. Because it came, it is here, it is now. We don't have to wait like the nation of Israel did for this Messiah, because the Messiah has already come. There's going to be this final gathering of God's people that we look forward to in this waiting period. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talks about this. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with them, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separate, as a shepherd, there's that shepherd word again, separates the sheep from the goats, and he will, know, he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. And it ends by saying this in verse 46, that those on the left, the goats, will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. First Thessalonians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writes, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. And that's how Micah chapter 5 ends in verse 4. 
which if they shall dwell secure forever. Revelation chapter 21 says, Then he saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. All those temporary, worldly issues that you've been struggling with in your few years on earth, or, or the years on earth, all those are done away with in this picture. And the, the Apostle John says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And ultimately the question is for any unbeliever now is, what are you waiting for? The, the message from the gospel is repent now. Don't wait any longer. No one is guaranteed another day. Stop waiting any longer for this Messiah, because the Messiah came, he lived, he died, he rose again, but no one is promised another moment in this life. And the message of the gospel is always, always, always repent now. Because when you do it now, it is good for the rest of your life. Amen. Yeah. It is eternal. Mm -hmm. Romans 2.5 says, Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience of God? Let's not talk about God. Not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Right? So God has allowed each and every one of us to live and breathe to the point where we were able to receive him by faith. He was patient with you. He was patient with me until I was 15 years old, and when I re received Christ by faith, God could have justly and rightly taken me from this earth before 15 years old because of my sin. And he would have been righteous in doing so. <clears throat> but because of his forbearance and his patience, it was displayed in my life that he allowed me to come to repentance and faith in him. Amen. And it goes on in Romans chapter 2, it says, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's judgment will be revealed. In John chapter 3 it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him, in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. See, the first time Jesus arrived, it was to save the world. But the second time Jesus arrives, and the second final time he arrives, it is to judge the world. And we have now, until that time that Jesus returns, every, or the whole world, they have the time from now until his return to repent. And place your faith in Christ so they can not be condemned. That's right. Luke 13, last passage on this, this idea of repentance, of repenting <coughs> now. It says there were some present at the very time who told them, who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with the sacrifices. And Jesus answered them and said, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the towers in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This is one of the best passages, by the way, to uh, bring up to someone who might think that bad things are happening to them out of their control because they're, they're worse sinners than anyone else. Uh, this is one of the best passages to use to, to bring out the idea that like no one's promised anything in this life. Towers could fall, or we, we've literally seen that. People die in accidents. Tragedies happen unexpectedly. Um, people die young and middle-aged and older age. Those things happen because we live in a sinful world. The message is it's not so much somehow putting the blame on those people. The message is, repent now because you have no idea what can happen to you. Amen. Repent now 
or you will likewise perish like anyone else. Just like anyone else will naturally perish, you will perish too. And Jesus says, repent, or you will all likewise perish. And here's the hope that Micah ends with in his, pro in his prophecy in chapter 7. It says, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever, but because he delights in steadfast love. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham, as you have sworn to our fathers in the days of old. The, the hope that God has given his people through the prophet Micah they had to wait for this hope to come. We don't have to wait anymore. We place our faith in him now. We see God changing us now. Uh, he changes our hearts right now. If you're still struggling with a sin issue, my, my first inclination would be to say, you probably don't hate your sin enough, which is why you're still struggling. You haven't yet reflected enough on the cross of Christ, of what God came to do in the first place. It wasn't to just give us earthly comfort in this life. It was to give us eternal comfort through peace and reconciliation with the God that we have sinned against. And a lot of times people are resistant to this idea of why would God be so mean and cruel to punish people for sins that we think are not that serious? Uh, why would he punish liars and thieves for, for things that we think are reserved for murderers and, and rapists and, and, and mass murderers? God has the same punishment for all sinners. It's eternal punishment, eternal suffering. So a lot of times people argue and say, well, why could God be that cruel to punish all sin the same? It's because they fail to understand God's rules in the first place. But we are very well uh, familiar with this idea that if the one person is sinned against, they're the ones that you should go to for reconciliation, right? Uh, if you ever played the cold shoulder, shoulder with someone else because they hurt your feelings and you just refused to talk to them until they came and apologized to you, then you know exactly what it is, what it means for us to have to go to God for forgiveness. If you and I as human beings can reserve our wrath for people who have sinned against us until they come to us and apologize, and we decide when they're reconciled with us, and we get to play God and say, well, I'm not going to forgive you until you do this for me. I'm going to ignore you and put you out of my love until you change this way for me. If we can do that as human beings, then we can understand God's standard. When God says, if you have sinned against me, you deserve my wrath. But what's the hope of the gospel? The same hope that is in the prophet of Micah. Like we have this wrath upon us currently without Christ. The hope is that God has provided us a way to reconcile our way. Because he is the one that we've sinned against. He is the one that we should go to for reconciliation. He is the one that has the key to heaven. He is the one that has the power to destroy both body and soul forever. So he is the one that we need to seek forgiveness from. That's not defining sin in your own way. It's looking at the word of God and letting that define what is sin, who is God, and what is the solution. And God gives us all that information throughout scripture. The solution is faith. The solution is understanding the depths of our sin, that we cannot be saved by how hard we try to be good. We can't be saved by all the good things that we think we've done in our past. We're saved by placing our faith in God. Why? So that God gets all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise for our salvation. Let's go to prayer. God, we thank you for the texts 
that we have throughout the scriptures and the law and the prophets that time and time again, the law and the prophets pointed to this Messiah. They pointed to Christ. And now we have the writings of the, of the apostles and the New Testament writers that point back to Christ. Everything points to Christ. God, we pray for your blessing as we hopefully dive into your word during this Christmas season. That we not forget the significance of the birth of the Savior. That that baby grew up to be the Lamb of God who is led like a lamb to the slaughter. For the forgiveness of sins. You give us peace and give us hope and give us joy all through faith in Christ alone. He has accomplished everything for us to help us to remain steadfast in our faith in Christ and understand the importance of the Savior who was born, who lived, who died, and who rose again so that we could be reconciled to you. For you are a God of peace. You've given us a message and ministry of reconciliation. Help us to share this message of reconciliation with those who do not yet know it. And bless our Christmas season as you look to all the passages about the birth of Christ in these next four weeks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If there's anyone that has any questions about anything that was talked about this morning, uh, feel free to please uh, come talk to me. Send me an email or phone call. Uh, set up an appointment sometime. We can talk more about this. We need to talk more about this. Uh, there's other ways of getting involved, too, in your growth in Christ and growth in God's Word. Uh, every Sunday we have Sunday school classes. Right now we, we have the Christianity, Cults, and Religions class that happens during Sunday school. That class is packed. It's full because the information is so rich, uh, not just about our own faith, but all the other faiths and how to minister to the other faiths, the other false religions out there. They're very popular, but they're false because they're not centered on Christ. Uh, and, and so there's so many ways to get involved in your discipleship and growth in the Lord. Uh, so be always uh, be looking at our website and uh, make sure we have information so we get a hold of you and make you known, um, uh, make sure you know all that's happening in our church life. So let's continue to worship. We'll stay together. Mm -hmm.